Good evening, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Please open up to Ephesians chapter 2. We are looking through uh, the Bible and especially the New Testament and looking at this point in our sermon series, uh, what are all of the blessings and what are all of the benefits? I say all are very loosely. We won't be able to plumb the depths of the entire mind that is the glories of the benefits in Jesus' blood, but we're having a crack at it. And uh, what we're asking is, what are the benefits and uh, 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 blessings that are purchased by Jesus through His blood? And what are all the different multifaceted ways we can look at the gospel? Of course, there's one gospel and there's one main thing that Christ's blood and Christ's cross accomplishes, which is, we could say, salvation. But in the New Testament and borrowing from the themes and the motives and the shadows of the Old Testament, we are taught by the apostles and the Lord Jesus himself to see salvation as a diamond with many, many different facets. And depending on which way you spin it and which way you look at it and depending on the lighting and which way you direct that light at that great diamond of salvation, different truths become clear as you understand them all distinctly. And that has been our task to understand all of the many blessings in salvation distinctly and clearly so that we can come back and look at salvation as a whole again and see it shine all the clearer and all the more brighter. Today, our consideration is how we have been brought... Move this. That's going to annoy me. uh, Is how uh, Jesus Christ's blood has brought us near. Open up to Ephesians chapter 2 if you've not already, and we're going to be looking at uh, verse 13. Verse 13 is our thematic verse tonight. Paul has been telling the Gentiles who were cut off from God's people in the Old Testament, though whom are brought in by faith in the New Testament, just as Jews were within the promises in the Old Testament, but cut off from Christ if they did not have faith in the New Testament. Paul says, you are both now in, but he sort of focuses on the Gentiles and says, you have to recognize where God has historically saved you from. The Jew has been saved, we could say, from within the household of God. They were here, they got saved. You Gentiles, this is an additional mercy in the gospel compared to the Old Testament law. The Gentiles have been brought in from the distant field and adopted into the family. This is, this is a foot, a sort of clarifying what God says to the Messiah prophetically in Isaiah 49, where he says, I will send you to save the house of Israel, but that's just not enough. I'm going to send you also to bring in the Gentiles. And and this is this mind-blowing riff. Salvation for a Jew is one thing. Salvation for non-Jews and Gentiles is an altogether mind-blowing reality that you can hardly make sense of unless the New Testament said it so clearly. And in this passage, Paul says, those who were outside of Christ, outside of the promises, outside of Israel, outside of God, they're Christless, hopeless, peopleless, godless things, these Gentiles. But, verse 13 says, but, Paul says, now, that is in the time of the gospel, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. May God bless that truth and this word in our midst this evening. God has brought us near by the blood of Christ. We have first have to understand this reality that even that verse starts off with, uh, that I think we logically have to understand before being brought near will have any significance and clarity to us. And that is the consideration and the reality that we were once far off. Some of you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus. You haven't been born again. Your life is not transformed. You're not worshiping, loving, and serving Jesus. You haven't placed your faith in the cross of Jesus alone. Therefore, you're not in Christ Jesus, and this still applies to you. You are currently far off. You may be a couple of meters from the pulpit. You may be sitting right with a Bible. You may be next to, even rubbing elbows with people going to heaven who are in Christ. But if you are not by faith in Christ, you are distant. You are far off from God. This picture, uh, this uh, imagery is introduced to us very early on in the Bible. We actually see after the first act of sin, that first rebellion against God's commands that happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. 
The response of God as He came to them was to uh, uh, apply upon them and to sentence and pass down to them a, 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 a just punishment of distance. That is that they were in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the, the language and the repetitious language of Genesis in the early chapters seems to suggest that day by day, God had a regular time in the afternoon of coming among Adam and Eve and being with them, spending time with them to be worshipped, to receive instruction, it may seem. Uh, nonetheless, at, uh, in some way, was he bodily imaged in front of them? Was he sort of corporeal in a vision or was he taking on a human form? Did he look like an angel? We're not sure. But in some way, God was with them, present, speaking to them. They were near to God. The whole world was a sinless, perfect paradise, but there was a focused uh, portion of it called the Garden of Eden where God then placed his image, Adam, with his uh, other image, Eve, put them together, and there they were to live under the countenance of God's blessing and in his presence in nearness to them on top of the mountain called the Garden of Eden. That was their pleasure, their privilege, and their blessing. But as sin came in, as they took from that tree, they were not meant to partake of. They took from the tree, and as God appeared, he sentenced upon them a distance from the garden. Now we might say, if they were already condemned to death at that point and hell for their sin, what difference does it make if they live in the garden or they live in the valley cast off away uh, in this imperfect world? What, what really is the difference? Well, the difference is that everything that happened in the former days, God wrote down to be a sermon for us. He kicked them physically out of the garden so that he might preach or symbolize what was spiritually true for them and what we can now learn from, that sinners, because of our sin, are distant from God and born after Adam, we are born into Adam and we are born into the lot that Adam earned for us, which is distance from God. We are far off from God by nature. Adam was not far off from God by nature. He was near to God by nature. But receiving a guilty uh, a state and, in, uh, and, and having the curse within himself of a sinful nature, what he passed on to us was a sinful nature. We are therefore, every human being after Adam and Eve born, we are born far off from God and God's, God's rejection of them, his exile of them out of the Garden of Eden was to picture that. We could go further and think a little bit uh, uh, further along in the history and the story of the unfolding work of God in the Old Testament. And we could remember when God dwells among his people again with all of these Garden of Eden themes and echoes in the tabernacle. When God saves Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea on, uh, after the Passover blood, and he brings them out into the wilderness and he instructs Moses, here's how to build the tabernacle, here's what cloth to use, here's how long and wide and whatnot it should be, here's all the furniture for the inside. This was to be God's dwelling among Israel. And Israel had this amazing, uh, unbeforeseen blessing that the true God of the universe the creator of all things, the God against whom all humanity have sinned and all of Israel have sinned, the God who saved us away from Egypt has now chosen to not just free us and let us go, but to free us and then constitute us as a nation beneath him and then to live among us. Monarchs build palaces far away from their people, far away from the slums. God set up his dwelling place in a tent, a tiny tent compared to God. Need I say that? In the middle of his people. And then he instituted an allotment of camping. And this was again given to us for, for a symbol, for a figurement, for a foreshadowing that each of the 12 tribes of Israel were to be camped at an equal distance away from the temple or the tabernacle there in the wilderness. You might think, you know, if I was writing the Old Testament, it would have been way better. And what they would have done, they would have camped in a cross shape, right? If an evangelical wrote the Old Testament, that's what they would have done. Really, Or maybe a fish, really subtle fish. I mean, yeah, that's, that's really Christian. Uh, why wasn't it a cross? Wouldn't that have been really, really preachy, really gospely? No, you're misunderstanding categories. The blessing of Israel, the blessing that God was giving to them uniquely, the blessing of the tabernacle was that they were near to God. And no tribe could put up their hand and say, well, I'm closer to God than you are. 
I'm more preferred. I'm closer to the tabernacle. All of the tribes were around the tabernacle in the same measurement because nearness to God is a great blessing. And being distant from God is the essence of the curse. We can think not only of the tabernacle and the camping, but also of the unclean people. We, we, we've said in previous weeks, some of the sick, if you were uh, 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 disfigured in body or you had a skin ailment like a leper uh, or some kind of bodily ooze, you were put out of the camp. You were to be put away from everybody else and especially, thinking in the symbol here, especially away from the temple and the tabernacle of God. God used distance to symbolize cursing in the Old Testament to preach to us that nearness to God is blessing and distance from God is punishment and judgment. So the unclean could not come near. Or especially the Gentiles could not come near. Especially by the time of the temple being built in Israel, after the time of the judges, in the days of Solomon, uh, the Gentiles were allowed and commanded to contribute wood, gold, silver, and metals, and they did. They contributed all sorts of things to Solomon to bring into Zion and build his temple, but yet they were not allowed in. They were allowed to, uh, to, to donate, they were allowed to send goods, but they were still not allowed. They could claim that a tree from my backyard has currently been forged into the shape of the thing that is now the Ark of the Covenant over there uh, uh, in the room of the covenant, one of the pillars, that was my back. And yet they themselves were not allowed in because they were a cut off people. They were not a member of, they, were not, they did not have covenantal spiritual interest in the commonwealth of Israel. And so they were cut off. They were distant. They were away. They were judged by God. We could also think of the picture of the scapegoat. That is on the Day of Atonement. If you're familiar with this, Leviticus 16, that they would bring primarily for the sins of the people. They had all sorts of bloody uh, uh, sacrifices that day. But the chief sacrifice were those two animals. And they would bring them both forward and one of them would be uh, taken into the temple, uh, uh, butchered, and its blood was taken into the nearness of God. That blood was taken in and sprinkled upon the altar to show that only by blood is there forgiveness of sins. But God showed another element of the curse of sin and God's judgment on sin that day in the scapegoat upon whom uh, the high priest would place his hand symbolically to identify all of Israel with him and all of Israel and him with this goat. He would place his hands upon the goat and he would recite and list and name all of the known sin of Israel. He would go through the laws. He would confess before God all of the sins that we have committed as a nation and individuals and tribes and families and clans he would confess them and he would impute them. He would reckon them. He would transfer them ceremonially and symbolically into the person, into the state and the account of the goat. Again, we said one of them would be butchered, but this one would be driven where? Out. It would be chased out of the camp away from the people, directionally opposite to the tabernacle of God. It would be chased out into the wilderness so it would be destroyed out there by natural ways of dying. It would be distant. And this was showing to us what ought to happen to every single sinner. Not only should we die and shed our blood, but then after dying, you see, one, 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 one animal wasn't enough to show the depth of the gospel because when one animal dies on the altar, it's dead. When a soul dies, you still live forever in an ongoing torment. And so this was the double symbol of the curse of sin. We ought to die and shed our blood and give up our breath and be killed under God's wrath. And then being dead, we should be driven into outer darkness there to suffer forever, away from the presence of God and away from His glory. This is the picture of sin that the Old Testament gives to us. Even it is epitomized probably in the history of Israel, in the exile of Israel. God had warned them as early as Deuteronomy. God had warned them continually through the prophets that you have a blessing, O Israel, of being near to God, near to his holy mountain, Zion, near to his temple. You have the honor of coming to the temple, making sacrifices. You have God in your midst. You have the oracles of God. If you disobey, if you 
cross his sins, if you transgress his laws, if you disregard his holiness, if you worship other gods and whore after other deities, then God will kick you out. He doesn't use uh, language of burial. He uses language of removal. And so we see in the exile that he brings, as he warned, as he prophesied, as he promised, He brings other nations to come in and not just slaughter them all, though that happened. Many of them were slaughtered and blood was shed. But more than that, the leftovers, the remnants, the few were then taken up in chains and removed to a far distant place. And this became one of the hymns that the uh, enslaved and removed exiles of Israel would sing. How they long for Zion, how they wish to go back to their homeland. Yet that was a part of God's curse and judgment on them. Because the judgment is pictured through separation. And this really is for us where each and every one of us found ourselves before the blood of Christ brought us near. Ephesians 2.13 says, Of Gentiles, what is true of all people spiritually, this was the parable of the Old Testament, that we were without Christ, without hope, without God in the world. Verse 13, you who were once far off. We have all been far off at one point in our life. From birth until you were saved. Some of you, I remind you, friends, are still far off right now. Being far off is language of being under God's judgment because of our sin due to the curse. You are, let's be clear, at every moment of every day beneath God's piercing Gaze. His eyes see you. You, are, you cannot escape from his presence so long as you have being because it is in his being that we receive ontological existence and being. He is the ground of all being. You can't escape from God. That's basic philosophy. That's basic theology. Yes, he's everywhere. But in a covenantal sense, it's the difference literally of heaven and hell. It's the difference of being in God's presence where he sheds grace and mercy, and blessings, and gifts, and his infinite eternal smile is, is shining down upon you. There's a difference of that and being under the, the, the torturous, tormenting, piercing judgment of his sword, of his eyes, of the crushing stone of his judgment, of the stone around the neck thrown into the river, curse for our sin, of the continually burning and sizzling flesh the, the Bible pictures this as, as being in a lake of sulfur, of, of being burned continually and worse every moment of our experience and consciousness that Jesus uses the language of things thrown into the furnace turned up to full heat. That is the presence of God with no mercy and no grace to judge sin. This is the grace of God with no judgment and no wrath to bless in heaven. God is equally as present in heaven and in hell, but he is not as near in heaven or in hell. He is near in heaven. That is the language of the Bible. He is near to us. He is with us. He is against those in hell. So do not think that you can escape from God's eyes, from his presence because of your sin. You cannot actually run away from God as Jonah tried. The the psalmist says, if I go to the bellies of the earth, to the depths of the ocean, to the farthest islands. There you are, God. If we travel through a wormhole to the most distant area of the entire cosmos, still there God will be waiting for us, seeing us, judging us. We are always in his ontological presence of being, but we are not near him in a relational way. We are, we are far away. And since we are distant from him relationally, none of his benefits or glories are therefore any good for us. I could tell you about the, uh, the king of Spain. I forget his name. I, uh, uh, Julio something. Uh, the king of Spain who uh, held a meeting. And in that meeting, he gave blessings upon all of his dignitaries. And I could read about this in the paper. So the king of Spain had people from his consort come into his palace. He sat them down. He fed them. He gave them all of these things. I could even read the details of the gold and the the, the incense and the titles that he bequeathed upon his gathered ones. And I could read in detail about the lordship and the knighthood that he passed down upon those people. And this would be very, very interesting to me. And I could read it as a matter of fact, but it has absolutely no benefit to me. 
because I'm not in Spain. I have no nearness to that king. I have no relationship to that king. I'm literally on the other side of the world, the better side of the world. I'm much further away from France, thank you, <laughs> over here in the glorious Pacific. We are, and, and, and sinners are like this. Yes, God is right there. Yes, you can know, you can maybe even as Jesus' parable shows us, if all those in hell or on earth could see into heaven, you could witness the blessings of God, you could see the glories of God, but they are no benefit to you because there is a categorical divide between you and it's not the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. It's your sin. It's a relational distance which symbolizes judgment for our sin. That is why... Jesus speaks in Matthew 8 and talks about the judgment that is coming. And he says, those people will be thrown into outer darkness. He doesn't just say deep darkness. He doesn't just say crushed. Here he says, thrown out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is why Revelation 22, echoing the earliest chapters of the Bible, says this, blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. We are brought back through the washing of our robes in Jesus' blood. We are brought back into the nearness of the city, not just Eden, but glorious heaven with God forever. However, he says, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Outside. God here again pictures, uses the distance, nearness relationship to draw the picture of our salvation. That in sin, we are outside. We are kicked out. We are removed. We are exiled. We are rejected. We are out. We are away. But in the blessing of Christ, we are near, we are known, we are brought close, we are presented to him. We are in the city gates, we are eating at his table, there is nearness. So this is what the Bible means when it says that we who were once far off. It means those who were once under the condemnation of God's law. Those who were disqualified by God's presence because of your sin. Those who were under God's judgment and suffering under the curse. That is what it means to be far, far off. But, Paul says, we have been brought near. And brought near by what? What is the instrumentation that brings us to near? It's not a vehicle. It's not a mobility. It's, it's really nothing that we would probably consider. We, we, we might think of Old Testament categories and go, oh, well, you know, by the priests they carried or they, uh, the, the oxen that carried the ark. What is it that brought us back in? What brings us back is the blood of Christ. You were brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, think, again, Old Testament categories. In the Old Testament, you could not come in if you were unclean, if you were impure, if you were not washed, or if you were literally anybody, no matter how clean you were, if it wasn't the right day of the year, the Day of Atonement. You couldn't come into the temple if you were unclean. You couldn't come in to do your work further into the temple as a Levite and a priest if you weren't cleansed by blood. And even if you were the high priest, you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies unless you had been sprinkled by blood. You see, in the Old Testament, God was already showing us that blood brings you near. Blood deals with the problem of judgment and curse and sin, and therefore the blood is able to bring you close to God. And so it is now in the New Testament that the blood of Jesus brings us near. There is one sense that we could look at the incarnation. And we all know that great Christmas text that in the incarnation, the distant God came near. He came more than just near. He came more than just among us in a temple. He became one of us. And so the prophecy of Isaiah calls the God-man, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, it calls him Emmanuel, God with us. But do you know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say that we have been brought near by God with us. Because the incarnation is absolutely powerless if it was not preparing the stage for the crucifixion. Your problem before God is infinitely worse than even God becoming man 
could complete or solve. That's not enough. God had to die as man. He couldn't just be man. He couldn't just enter man's nature. He couldn't just be a man, be a perfect man. That was enough. The incarnation is powerless to save us if it doesn't lead to the incarnate God shedding his incarnate blood for us. It is the blood of Christ that brings us near, not just the incarnation. It is not even the fact that Jesus showed a very good example in his life. He was perfect. He was sinless. He fulfilled the law right in front of us. He showed us the divine, perfect fulfillment of human righteousness according to God's law. Is that enough to save us? No. Christ's righteousness and Christ's sinlessness is powerless to bring us near unless it is given to us in the great exchange at the cross. His righteous, perfect, undefiled, unblemished, spotless blood is value less unless it is poured out in transaction of our souls. The thing that makes it able to save is his righteousness. But the thing that actually saves is it being poured out. The blood of Christ brings us near, not his incarnation, not merely his good example, not even his healing ministry. We might look at at the Gospels and say, you know, in the Gospels, Jesus does what no priest of the Old Testament could ever do. Instead of saying to the leper and saying to the unclean woman, go away, the law forbids you, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Mosaic Code rejects you, back up, go away, rack off. But Jesus didn't say that. He came up to them and he drew near to them. And unlike any Levite, he drew near and touched them. And unlike anything in the Old Testament, he never became unclean, they became clean. Isn't this amazing? The the holiness, the, the nearness is solved, isn't it? No, because many of those healed and touched and seen and spoken to and dwelt amongst by the incarnate Jesus then rejected him and crucified him and are now in hell. The ministry of Jesus, the touching of Jesus does not bring you near. The blood of Jesus brings you near. In other words, We have absolutely no Christianity without a murdered, bloody cross. There are so many people today, every single one of us actually, to some measure, belong to this category. But there are so many people today that are tempted to just divert our our teaching into a philosophical or maybe socially acceptable form of preaching. I'm preaching good news of life and love and acceptance and Jesus is for life and love and you will, uh, he he preaches humanity and goodness and and neighbor and, and a cohesive society and he brings peace and racial disharmony and all of these other kinds of benefits people want to talk about and he was God in flesh, good. Oh, he was a perfect man, good. He healed and he did many miracles, good, and he will bring us all to life again. That's a damning religion. That's many kinds of liberal Christianity. And what is so damning about it is that it forgets the blood of the cross. To hell with any religion, damn any religion, go to hell every religion that does not center our message on the bloodied, crucified, murdered Jesus who bore God's wrath, shed his blood and was resurrected three days later. It is the blood of Jesus, though vile to the Jewish mind. It is the blood of Jesus, though though insulting to the Gentile Greek philosophical mind. It is the blood of Jesus, horrifying as it may be to the modern sensible mind. It is the blood of Jesus that must stay the very center, the front, the spear tip, the banner over all of our preaching and all of our Christianity. There is no Christianity without the blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered. That is what is meant by the blood. Not just death, but a suffering into death. His blood physically was not just shed in his death as the spear went through his heart. His blood has begun to be shed through his anguishes in the Garden of Gethsemane and the judgments and the beatings and the beard pulling and the slappings that he received and the whippings and the scourgings that he received all night long. He suffered, that is the sense in which the blood brings us near, because he suffered. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't just say, so that he might bring us some of God's blessings. He doesn't scoop up a collection of heaven's blessings, make a trip towards us and pass them out in division. He picks you up. 
He takes you to God and presents you undefiled and full and complete because of his blood. What is able to make Jesus pick up a filthy sinner, not a blemished, spotless, not an unblemished, spotless sacrifice like a Levite might do in the Old Testament. He doesn't pick us up perfect and whole. He picks us up vile, incomplete, sinners, rebellious. He picks us up. And what in the world could qualify him to walk into the presence of God beyond the Levitical temple guards, through the veil of the curtain, into the grave, into the holiest of all holy places, into heaven, and present you, filthy, defiled, disgusting sinner, and me, in into the very lap of God the Father. What could qualify him to do that despite all of the uncleanliness in us? It's his blood shed on the cross. It opens the gate. He entered. It opens the curtain. He entered. It opens the room, the palace of the Father. He goes in. It enters the throne room doors. He enters in. It opens the heart, the love, the acceptance, the justice of the Father. Jesus enters in by his own blood. And there we are with him. So we need to say this, how does the blood of Christ bring us near? By solving the problem that made us far. What is it that made us far, distant, uh, cast out? It was our sin. It was our unworthiness. It was our unholiness. And how does that blood bring us near then? Hebrews 9.15 tells us. A death has occurred that redeems us from the transgressions committed under that first covenant. So what is the power of the blood to bring us near? Is that it deals with those things which kept us distant, which is our sin, rebellion, and uncleanliness. It brings us near because he first was cast out. God doesn't say in the gospel, in Jesus, the the Bible does not mean when it says, but now in Christ you are brought near. He doesn't mean, but now God has matured and gotten over and done away with all of his pesky legal requirements. He doesn't care about holiness anymore. The unholy may come in. He doesn't care about judgment and punishment anymore. Now the guilty may come in. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel progression in the arrival of Jesus was that now in Christ, All of the judgment upon those who were cast off, all of the distance being experienced and suffered by those who were cast out, all of that distance was taken up, taken upon Jesus. And Hebrews 13 says, He was treated like the innards and the fecal matter of the sacrificial animals. Hebrews 13 says that even the sacrificial animal was gutted, And the entrails and the disgusting parts that smell if burned are spared from the altar's fire, heaped up into a disgusting pile, shipped on a wheelbarrow outside of camp so no one can smell it, and burned out there. And then it says, and so Christ also suffered for us outside the camp. He did not eradicate the distance. He absorbed the distance. He did not merely brush away the distance. He He experienced the distance internally, spiritually, on a soul level, sacrificially on the cross. He was made as cast off and cast away from God in his human nature. He experienced a distance from God that we can truly never even imagine. Even the soul in hell for a million years will not experience the fullness of separation and distance that Jesus felt and experienced on the cross with his perfect unfallen mind, fully opened to experience the fullness of God's wrath, dying not just for one man's sins, but uncountable men and women's sins. Jesus brings us near by his blood because in his blood shedding, he was cast out and experienced the distance. He was the ultimate scapegoat and he runs away into the wilderness under God's wrath with our sin, never to be seen again. He runs off and you are therefore cleansed and reconciled or in the language of Ephesians 2, brought near. You are brought near. This is our third and final consideration. This is, I love this, (laughs) this nearness given to us through the bloodletting sacrifice of Jesus which pardons our guilt. This is more than a mere pardon. It is that. It's a glorious pardon but it is more than a mere pardon. 
told before the story of an English man who in his early, uh, I believe it was late teen years, married a young gal, was finding things hard, uh, it hard to make ends meet, stole a couple of bits of bread and silk and was sentenced to decades in Australia in the prison camps. And he kept on trying, this is in the 1800s, kept on trying to escape in order to get back home to his beloved newlywed wife, whom he had not heard of, heard from since he was imprisoned. And every time he escaped, he was uh, whipped with the lashes of the captains. And when eventually Brisbane, the worst of the worst prison uh, uh, areas, was opened up, he was shipped up there in a chain gang. He was chained to other people, and there he spent his years and his days, and he counted over a thousand marks and scars of whippings that he'd received upon his back in all of his years of treachery. And all of this, I know human responsibility and all the things that he did to, you know, he broke the law and whatnot, but all of this for a measly few loaves of bread and silk is injustice. And in his later years, I believe he was about 70 years old, a remarkable amount of time to live back then, especially for someone with such a hard life. He receives a letter of pardon from the monarchy, which to him I think would mean almost absolutely nothing already having ruined his entire and spent all of his entire life in chains. But I tell you what that pardon didn't grant. It did grant freedom. He was allowed to start a new life with what little money he had to to begin uh, uh, drinking himself to death before he was saved in the 1870s. Praise God, we'll see him in heaven. But that letter didn't come with an invitation to the king's table. He wasn't pardoned and then accepted in and brought near and the royal fleet was going to come and pick him up from that uh, long lost Australia and come back to his family and come back to the king and queen's family and sat down in the royal uh, 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 feasting table and treated like family. He wasn't brought near. He was left at the ends of the earth, but he was pardoned. But the gospel is, is much more than that. It is not just that the distant God says, Whoever you are, whatever it is that you did, I don't quite remember, I won't send you to hell. Enjoy the rest of your life. And afterwards, annihilation. It's not the gospel. It's not even that you get to go into heaven somewhere, there'll be a slum for you, or you can be in heaven, God will be far away. It'll be paradise for you, he won't put up with you. No, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that you are not just pardoned, not just blessed, not just benefited, but that you are brought as near as divinely possible God can do to humanity. As near as a non-divine being could possibly be to that divine being, so you will be and are in Christ Jesus by his blood. There is not even God, not even God could could, could make us closer, nearer to himself than he has now made us in Christ because he has done the maximal benefit and blessing and draw nearing that he could ever do in the gospel. He made us not just near him, not just next to Christ. He put us in Christ and Christ is his son. We are in Christ, the blessing of all blessings because it is the nearness of all nearness. That means even now, Paul does not say in the future he will bring you near and in your resurrection you'll be able to behold God and then you will be close in relationship once you're done sinning. Now the glory of the gospel is that all of this is past tense. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ being applied to you. The moment that you had faith, you became, though not experiential of it, maybe not even aware of this blessing till tonight, the moment you placed your faith in Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, and you stopped trusting in your own good works to get you to heaven, or your own lies to escape from the reality of hell, when you trusted in Jesus Christ as a saviour of sinners and entrusted your soul to him, at that very moment, you became in Christ, in heaven, in God. Relationally, covenantally speaking, you are as close to God as you ever could be. Imagine an angel came to Adam and after decades, maybe centuries, he lived a long time of his lostness and distance. The angel came and said, it's done. Something's happened. God is merciful. And he brings him and zooms him through creation back to that once glorious paradise. 
And he takes them and the angels, they lift their flaming swords and Adam's allowed to walk back in and he remembers. All the memories start flashing back into his mind of when he used to walk with God. And he goes up the mountain and he doesn't stop there. He goes up into heaven with God. Less glorious than what we have. The leprous Jew, cast off from the great festival of the Day of Atonement, not even allowed to wash, to watch the blood shedding ceremony, not even allowed to be that close to all of the, the, the show and the charade on the Day of Atonement. He's leprous, he's cast off, he's distant. He can maybe, if he bends down just right and catches the wind, he can maybe hear one of the horns being blown that the sacrifice was made. Imagine a Levite comes and grabs him by the arm and starts walking him. He walks him up the mountain, walks him all the way to Zion, walks him through the gates of the temple, walks him right into the outer court, past the bronze altar, through the beautiful curtains, into the holy place, throws open the, the huge curtains, walks him into the holy place and sits him upon the ark. Nowhere near as close as we presently are in Christ Jesus. God has done in Christ what could be done in no other way. The blood of Christ being sprinkled upon you brings you into Christ's person and experience. And we are therefore near to God in Christ. How near could we be compared to this? How, how much closer could we be? No closer. How glorious it is to think we are not just with Christ, near Christ. We are in Christ and in that sense near to God. Brought near by the blood of Christ. I was thinking upon this and I stumbled upon a hymn, a portion of a hymn from Horatius Bonar. He says this, By nature and by practice far. How very far from God. Yet now by grace brought near to Him through faith in Jesus' blood. So near, so very near to God. I cannot nearer be. For in the person of his son, I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God. More dear I cannot be. The love wherewith he loves the son, such is his love for me. Do you realise you can say that? Blasphemous though it might even sound. That if you have faith in Christ and that's the hinge of everything. You are brought near. You are made close. You are in Christ if you have faith. Not do anything, not accomplished anything, not gave anything, not contributed. Squat if you're sitting there in your weakness and your hopelessness, leaned in your soul upon Jesus and said, take me please, save me please. I trust your cross as the only path to heaven to make me near to God and to deal with my distance. You do that and you can say with this hymn writer, I could not be dearer to God because the same love that he loves his son, he loves me with. I am in his son, cherished by God as his son, because in his son, I am his son. Not by nature, but by adoption and salvation. So I wonder, I ask, I beg and I demand that you ask yourself this question as we're closing. Am I brought near or am I still at a distance? And do you see how, 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 how bifurcating that is? That separates all of us. It's not, well, upon what spectrum do you see yourself? Where, where, where uh, uh, from very far compared to very near, where do you see yourself on the spectrum? There's no such spectrum. There's hell and on the right hand of God. There is in a cursed, cast off state or there is as near as near could be. That is the question. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you experienced forgiveness, the delight of soul, the assurance of pardon? Have you entered into a clean conscience? Have you been adopted, changed, transformed, born again? Have you been brought near by the sprinkled blood of Jesus? And if you have not, it can happen in a moment. You must simply believe upon Christ and grasp this promise by faith. Let's pray. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You have made us to share and be partakers in and beneficiaries of all of the heavenly blessings in the spiritual blessing, in the spiritual places in Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you have brought not just heaven's blessings to us, but that you have brought us in your person, in your cross, by your blood to the Father. You have brought us near, not merely made us 
tasters or partakers in emblems and symbols of glory. You have entered into our very nature in order to bring us to yourself and be right now, though on earth, those still sinners, those still struggling, those still blind because we don't see with our eyeballs, yet we know we are there with you. We are in you. We have been given to share with you. We are in your wounds. We are covered by your blood. And when the Father looks at you, he sees us. Father, thank you for being so merciful as to receive all those that Jesus brings. Thank you for the unfathomable grace that you chose to save us before the foundations of the world, though unworthy and defiled we would be. Thank you, Lord God, that you sent your spirit now to join us to Jesus Christ, now to help us to enjoy the benefits of being joined to Jesus Christ. And we ask now that he would be pleased to act upon, to move upon, to bring to life those who are still dead in their sins. Allow them to bring, allow him, send him to bring them to life so that they may place a living faith upon Jesus Christ and be brought near by his blood. We thank you for the blood of the cross. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for all these things in the crucified and risen lamb's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.